Now we're going to be talking about shellcode, shellcode analysis. What's, what's shellcode? Why is shellcode called shellcode? There, there's one for you. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Bin SH. Yeah, Corey, you can't answer any more questions. From an exploit. Um, gives you a shell from an exploit. Yeah. Back in the day, I say that way too much. Um, shell code used to be about providing a shell to the user. Um, and and it, it, it still can be that way. Um, something where you have an exploit that you're going to send against a typically a, a server that's on the internet, server-based uh, exploit rather than client-side. And as soon as you send the exploit, if it's successful, you get a, that connection back. And so for the author of the, well, for the user of the exploit, when they send that is like immediately when they know if it works or not. And if it works, they get a, a connection back. They, they, you know, get some access to the box. And that was typically a, since I'm sending it right away, give me a shell on the box so I can look around and see what's going on. As things have uh, progressed and as exploits have moved towards the client side, um, the time between when the attacker sends a exploit and when that exploit actually occurs has increased. And so the attacker doesn't know when that's going to happen. So if he has actual like shell code in there, as in it will create a shell and attempt to connect it back, if the author uh, or the person sending it isn't sitting at their keyboard right at that moment when the person opens the you know malicious PDF, then they're going to miss that that connection back. So what you know shell code originally meant is you actually get a you know a shell connection back and their Metasploit modules. I will still do that, but what it has come to mean is um, anything that is um, used in a uh, exploit for um, basically that that executes on the system. Getting uh, that the exploit will execute on the system, whether it be creating a shell and connecting back to you, or dropping files onto the system and executing those that will then further embed themselves and then connect back. Okay. Um, shell code. Uh, position independent. So what a, a shell code author Um, may not know is where in memory that um, code is going to end up being loaded. So they will make that code such that it's not depending on um, it's not depending on where it's loaded in memory. Um, such as it, it doesn't have like jump 401 to D6. You know, it doesn't jump to a specific um, memory location. Instead, it'll do relative jumps. So instead of jump 401 to D6, it'll say, okay, jump ahead six bytes, or jump ahead 12 bytes, or jump back, you know, 24 bytes. So it's it's relative to that uh, that that code, um, and that's position independent. And any of the references that it's making to its own data will be position independent, and will be relying on it being loaded in its specific place in memory. And I'll show you an uh, example of that, what that means. Um, yep, they, they're going to have to, um, if they're wanting to call any kind of API calls, they're going to have to um, find those API calls um, either in memory or actually uh, through a set of load library get proc address calls. A um, whole bunch of different file types, known, exploited, DBE, yay, miter, 
um, PDFs, JavaScript in PDFs, MS Office documents, the old, the old OLED format, Flash, Flash in PDF, Flash in MS Office, MS Office. Uh, RTF, Java, compiled help, crazy, all sorts of things. Um, yeah, so this is just the nesting, uh, like you saw with uh, the flash embedded in all sorts of stuff. Uh, keep in mind that within one file type, there may be another file type that's actually embedded in that. And actually, you may have another object that's embedded within the flash. That is where the actual exploit is happening. Fun times. Um, shellcode objects often encoded. Um, for, for various reasons. So with PDF, plate encoding is their terminology for it. That's actually just zlib. Uh, compressing it, which legitimate stuff will do to, to reduce the file size. Um, but it's also a way of preventing um, um, like very simple AV states that look for specific um, byte patterns. Uh, if it doesn't know how to do the uh, decompression, then it's not going to be looking inside of that, that uh, compressed string. Uh, okay, uh, we talked about that. Downloaders, yeah, downloader, uh, downloaders versus droppers, um, shell code that, that will attempt to, you know, all it does is attempt to download a a second stage, like an executable from a specific location, drop it on disk and execute. That's that's going to be your, your really small uh, shell code versus droppers that um, will um, also the shell code piece can be small, but what it does is it actually looks within the file itself or within the memory that it's it's working within um, to say, okay, my my object that I'm going to drop onto disk is actually already here with me. I don't have to reach out over the internet and get it. And usually that, uh, the, what gets dropped is then encoded, obfuscated somehow. So people can't just, you know, look at a PDF and look for an MZ, you know, uh, or PD header in there. It's then obfuscated somehow. Um, 